Hello and welcome to Policy Watch, a packed snapshot of the week's biggest business developments, their context, their relevance and policy impact. I'm Govind Raj Ethiraj. The goods and services tax regime is underway with rates having been fixed for most goods by the GST Council at 18%. Now some 81% of goods will attract tax or equal or lower than 18%. Revenue Secretary Hasmukh Adia has said, more importantly, the overall tax burden of the average household will decline after the implementation of GST, Mr. Adia has also said. For example, hair oil and toothpaste will be taxed at 18%, lower than the current levels of 23 to 24%. On the other hand, cars will attract a rate of 28%, while luxury cars will attract an additional cess of 15%. Now, as the final touches on GST are being put, the question we're asking is, how will this play out on July 1st? Will we start seeing the new prices kick in immediately? What could be the challenges and what are the key challenges ahead? To discuss this, I'm joined by BJ Maheshwari, Director at Dwarkesh Sugar, MS Money, Senior Director, Indirect Tax at Deloitte Haskins, Abhishek Rastogi, Partner, Indirect Tax at Khaitan, and M. Manikam, Executive Chairman at Sakti Sugars. Thank you all for joining me. Let me uh, start with you, Abhishek. So now that the, the rates are in, is that a relief? Uh, I think uh, a very mixed reaction, if you will see, 19% uh, of the goods are in a higher rate of 28%. Uh, mm. And while the comment which was made yesterday was uh, with a word only, only 19%. Mm. But if you will see, about 230 products uh, would go to a 28% bracket, mm. which means a lot of these products would move from 22, per, uh, 22 to 24% rate mm. to a 28% uh, rate. Mm. And uh, for a moment, you know, I would park uh, cars or luxury cars or uh, right. uh, goods like air conditioners, etc. But there would be a lot of uh, items apart from these also which go to a higher rate. Mm. So that's, I mean, we'll have to uh, wait, okay. wait and watch and see that what exactly is the impact on a lot of these products. Okay, so money, how are you seeing it? Plus or minus? I would broadly see it as a plus mm -hmm. and what I would say is that... Uh, I'm saying from a householder's point of view. Yeah, yeah. So mm -hmm. from a householder's point of view, majority of the items that a householder uses have been kept either at 18 or 12. Mm -hmm. uh, some of them have even been kept at 5. Mm -hmm. Now, what is good about mm. the about uh, the announcement yesterday mm. is so the like fact sugar, tea, coffee, sugar, tea, coffee. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And what is good about yesterday's announcement is the fact that there is a conscious effort made mm. to ensure that products which are consumed by the masses are kept at a lower rate. Mm -hmm. Now, this in terms of policy making has never happened, you know, before. So mm. we are not aware any time in the past where the government has segregated products based on the consuming class. Mm. So these have been segregated on the basis of the consuming class mm. and majority of the products that are consumed by the masses have been kept at 5, some at 12. Mm. The products which come at 18 are the mass consumption items. So, mm. so you know, in terms of numbers, 43% of the items mm. are now at 18. Mm. But when you look at the mix of those 43% items, these are either items that you use sporadically mm. or items which are low value items. Mm -hmm. So to give an illustration, uh, a tea or a coffee is something which is a daily consumption item. Now that is kept at five, whereas a toothpaste is kept at 18. Mm. Now when you look at it in terms of value, what is the value of a toothpaste that a household consumes in a month vis-a-vis -a, -vis a tea, coffee, food grain, cereals, package data, and mm. other things? Mm. Now value-wise, those would be much more. Mm. And therefore, an 18 for a typical household is applied very low value. Mm -hmm. No, so what is it saying? I mean, what does that mean or what is the... It means that at a broad level, mm. GST is not expected to be inflationary at all the way okay. it was feared. Okay. It is going to be good. Mm. Uh, there may be a spike for a few products or certain products, mm. but overall the effect will certainly not be inflationary. Right. Okay. Mr. Maheshwari, can I bring you in? How are you reading the, the first cut of proposals or the, the rates that have come out? As far as uh, GST uh, Council uh, announcement on the various rates which have been agreed, uh, I feel like uh, it's not going to be inflationary because uh, the rates which have been agreed are, are more or less, you know, like uh, what we used to pay in the case of sugar industry. Like in case of sugar, the taxes were around 200 rupees per quintal that was on the basis of a fixed value of rate and it was not linked to a rate as such. Now the 5% would work out to more or less what we used to pay earlier. Uh, similarly, uh, you know, a rate which is there on the rectified spirit, uh, the ethanol and all, which has been now agreed at 18 percent is also I think in line with what we were expecting. So I don't think you know it's not going to be any uh, inflationary as such. So let me come back to you uh, Abhishek. So suppose we've, we've got all these rates now. One of the objectives of GST was that it would ease out processes, right? It would make things, and I'm going to get you in also on this money. So what's this, what is this achieving in the broader sense of what we set out to achieve in GST? See, I, I think uh, we have discussed it in the past also mm. that multiple rates cannot be ignored in a country like India. 
But I think what was more surprising for me to see uh, was that only 17% of the items were in the 12% rate bracket, mm -hmm. which means that 43% in 18% and uh, about 17% in the 12%. Mm -hmm. Now the question which arises today is mm -hmm. that will we go back again to the classification disputes which used to happen mm -hmm. two, three decades back? Mm -hmm. So because you think between 12 and 18%? Yes, they, will they be, could yeah. have had some rate like 16%, mm -hmm. converged all these uh, mm -hmm. goods uh, of 12% and 18% in a 16% rate. Mm -hmm. uh, similarly, you know, they could have had services at 16%. Mm -hmm. So a lot of classification disputes which would uh, may arise, you know, because of these two rates of 12 and 18 percent, mm. to a very large extent that could have been addressed uh, by a single rate because uh, the uh, the uh, point is that only 17 percent of the goods are falling in that 12 percent rate, right. which okay. may lead to confusion. Money, how is it going to play out in a larger sense? Are we going to achieve the broader objectives? I'm, I'm sure we will, but in what way and how and when? Uh, I would say that at a very broad level, it is certainly going to help us with a broader objective. Mm. Because if you look at the classification that has been put out yesterday, mm. it's certainly an improvement on the existing classification. Mm. It's far simpler, mm. item num point number one. Right. Point number two, in the existing classification, we had to look at XI separately, mm. we had to look at VAT separately. Mm -hmm. Now we have to look at only one. Mm. And when I say VAT separately, it was VAT of 29 states separately. Mm. So now we are looking at one particular classification mm. for one particular particular product. Right. Now, here again, uh, expecting that we will not have four rates, as we have discussed in the past, is a little too simplistic considering, you know, the diversity of our country. Sure, sure, sure. That's a given. No, yeah. no, I'm only trying to understand, are we achieving the larger objective of, let's say, uh, uh, facilitating commerce, trade, giving a I kicker so. to GDP, as we said we would? Which yes. Was, yeah. Yes, I think so. And I think it is very good. Uh, uh, a very simple example is the manner in which uh, yesterday, the finance ministry has announced a rate classification. For the first and, time, right. instead of putting it in uh, a long publication format, mm. they have gone for a tabular format. Mm. They have said, these are at 5, these are at 12, these are at 18, these are at 28. Okay. We and have the not fact that it. they put it out reasonably earlier, or at least ex yeah. earlier than expected, is, is a good move. Absolutely. And right. they have put it out within a few hours of the meeting getting concluded. Right. Okay. Let me let me get one more view. M. Manikam, uh, chairman of Sakti Sugar, has also joined us. Uh, Mr. Manikam, what's your, how are you reading it? I know sugar is at a lower level. But what, what's your sense of the larger objective of GST and whether what you've seen so far helps that? Um, see, the larger uh, idea of GST is fairly good. But what I'm anticipating is that, you know, given our environment and given our kind of uh, policies, probably about three months of confusion, three months of uh, everybody talking about, you know, what belongs where, and a hell of a lot of clarification like we had in the demonetization, 80 clarification in 40 days. So, and then probably we'll arrive home in about, in about three months. But it should be a good progress after three months. Right. And, and what's your sense of what is unfinished, uh, Mr. Manikam? I mean, what needs to be done here on from, from what we've seen so far? Uh, we don't know what is unfinished because we never do anything in full measure because you're replacing, uh, you know, taxes of something like 30 states and, you know, variations which have been there in one stroke. So we don't really know. I'm not sure if the people in Delhi have looked at all the 30 states in detail. So it's probably going to be, you know, we'll learn on the fly as we go. Right. And, and can, I, uh, uh, can I also get you in, Mr. Maheshwari? So if you were to look at unfinished, or not unfinished in terms, of, in terms of what's not done, but what needs to be done in the next uh, few weeks and couple of months to make sure that the process of rollout is seamless, what's your sense? See, as far as uh, I would just uh, concentrate myself on the sugar sector, there are a lot of clarifications which would be required. Basically, in case of sugar cane, the GST Council has agreed that the rate would be 5%. But again, there are clarifications required because there are two categories of sugar cane. One, sugar cane which is provided as seed, whether fresh or chilled, and uh, the other one is uh, where it is not provided as seed. Now, in our case, whatever sugar cane which we get is all provided as See it, and then and there is a zero rate for that. So uh, all, all this clarification is re required from GST Council and the others. Whether it would be a zero rate or whether it would be five percent. Right. Okay. So let's let's look at I mean the the task in the few months ahead. I mean including up to July first. So what's spending money? To my mind, what is spending is expecting uh, a lot of clarity from the government in terms of how GST will be administered. Mm -hmm. How are the tax authorities going to look at GST administration? Mm -hmm. And one of the things that the government can do in order to make GST more acceptable 
is to go very soft for the first six months or so. Mm -hmm. For the first six months, don't focus overly on classification, for instance. Mm -hmm. Even if someone is paying 12% instead of 18% due to whatever reason, mm -hmm. go a little slow. It could be a genuine misinterpretation. Mm -hmm. Over a period of six months, make people adapt to the whole system. Mm -hmm. Because we have to bear in mind that this is something which is happening after around 60 years of a certain tax system. Mm -hmm. So when you move into a new tax system, there are going to be obviously challenges for business houses. And whether large, whether small, I would say smaller and mid-sized businesses should be treated with complete kid gloves. Mm -hmm. They should be given an enormous amount of freedom with no interest, no penalty for the first six months. Okay. Mm. And this should go as a directive from the government to people mm. by saying, look, we understand it's a new system for you. Mm. It's new for us as well. Mm. We are going to treat you with kid gloves. So six months, don't worry. Do your best to be compliant. Mm. Pay your tax. In six months, get things rolling. And maybe introduce all the machinery implementation provisions, the audit, the interest, the penalty, and all of those a year from now. If they do that, I would say that it becomes very acceptable. Once it is that, acceptable, right. half the battle is won. Right, but you're saying that the only discrepancy, if at all, is that people may end up paying lower rates than higher rates. Or people may end up not getting credits, or people may mm. avail excess credits that, that you're entitled to. Mm. So there could be genuine differences because it's a new tax system. Right, but is there anything that suggests that people might take advantage or find loopholes very quickly? See, in any system, there would be a small proportion which takes advantage. I would say broadly that businesses would want to be compliant right. in GST okay. because the rates are reasonable. Mm. So if the tax authorities are reasonable in administering it, mm. there is no reason why you know we should not have 90% compliance from day one. Okay. Uh, what's your sense, Abhishek? Uh, see, I have two points to make here. Mm. One very important point is now that these rules are out, uh, we know for a fact that there were certain points which were to be addressed. Mm. We will see how these have been addressed now because rules cannot travel beyond the statute. Mm. And uh, so both from the procedural part of it and from the statute part of it, I think there will be a lot of discussion in a couple of months about the constitutional validity of a lot of these provisions. Mm. And a few of these provisions may still be ultra wires. Mm. So I think the bigger uh, question there is that, you know, whether there will be a lot of matters which will go to the courts mm. uh, to challenge the constitutional validity or to prove mm. that few of these provisions are ultra wires. Mm. So that's on uh, the constitutional part and the ultra wires mm. part of it. The second related point I think which is very relevant uh, from the Indian context is that a lot of people have already started planning. Mm. Uh, so I would not call that uh, as a mean of tax evasion, mm. but yes, whatever is available there as per the provisions of law, mm. people have already started doing that. So people have already started thinking of having certain warehouses mm. so that the credits can be transferred uh, to address the issue of uh, an invoice being less than more than 12 months old mm. so people are thinking but you know till the time you are within the provisions of law mm. nobody could stop you to do that mm. so both from this planning perspective and from uh, challenging a lot of these provisions from the constitution perspective i think we will have to have a uh, clear watch there right so mr meshwari can i last word here so are, how are you planning as a company to uh, you know not planning i'm sure you're already acting upon it but w what is the tasks that you've cut cut out for yourself in the coming weeks? No, basically, yes, uh, we are uh, going through these reads and we are also like, you know, involving our consultants and then uh, we're just involving our experts also to uh, advise us on the uh, way forward and all. We have already engaged, uh, you know, consultants on this issue. Yes, and uh, uh, yes, uh, we need to do a study and then we need to analyze this as to the impact, uh, how it would uh, affect the company, the sugar industry as such. Well, we need to go in for a break now. Coming up on the other side, there are new index of industrial production numbers which are actually looking good and better than before. What does that mean in terms of policy? Uh, to discuss this, I'm joined by Sujan Hajra and Upasana Bhardwaj. Stay with me. Welcome. I'm Amritan Shurai. You're watching Constitutionally Yours. Every five years, people get an opportunity yeah. to choose a new idea. It is the state assembly which is to decide how the fund is to be utilized. Government of India should revisit the areas where the people are lagging behind. Two criteria are taken into consideration. First, on the economic structure. Central government is always expected to have acted with equal dimension. Watch Constitutionally Yours on Rajya Sabha Television.
Welcome back to Policy Watch. The government has introduced changes to two key economic indicators, the Index of Industrial Production and the Wholesale Price Index, or WPI. Now, the new IIP numbers show that industrial production grew at a robust 5% in 2016-17, as opposed to the number of 0.45% shown by the old series. Now, the new series also shows that industrial activity grew at 2.7% in March, up from 1.9% in February, in contrast to a contraction of 1.2% in February. Now, the new series also takes into account 809 items up from 620, but also deletes 124 items, including picture tubes. Now, there are also changes in weightages. Now, the question we're asking is, how will all this affect or impact our assessment of economic indicators like inflation and growth, and more importantly, the key decisions on factors like interest rates? To discuss this, I'm joined by Sujan Hajra, Chief Economist at Anandrati Securities, and Upasna Bharadwaj, Senior Economist at Kotak Bank. Thank you both for joining me. Uh, Sujan, let me begin with you. So first, your broad takeaway, the new series of numbers, what do they tell us? Uh, obviously, it tells us that there, is a, there has been a very significant change in the structure of the economy from 2004-05, mm -hmm. where the ba base was. So this, in some sense, is a much more uh, representative picture. In fact, if you look at the successive revisions of IIP itself, say first you see the 8081 series, 9394 mm -hmm. series, then 2004 series. Every time, there, when the, whenever there is a change of base, mm -hmm. because the as you rightly said, the structure of commodities and the weightings also change. Mm -hmm. There is a huge change in the performance. Mm -hmm. So uh, this time also you are seeing huge change in the performance. Most importantly, if you look at this IIP and WPI, now, now corroborates with the new national income number, which mm. was revised in January 2015. Mm. So they, uh, earlier, the problem we are seeing is that industry industrial numbers are going in one direction, mm. whereas the GDP numbers are go going in another direction, mm. which made the decision-making process very difficult. Mm. Now they will be, whether they are right or wrong is a different thing, but they, but they will be, be co terminus. Right. Okay. Uh, Upasna, a quick reaction from you. What's your sense and takeaway from the changes that we've seen so far? No, definitely, uh, like Susan said, I think uh, one is most importantly that, uh, you know, the uh, the shift in the base has aligned itself to the key important other indicators that we have been tracking, uh, largely the CPI and the, uh, you know, uh, uh, GDP numbers particularly, given the kind of deviation that we were seeing in the previous series between the industrial growth in GDP and in IIP. This was a much uh, awaited, uh, you know, uh, rebasing that was needed. And at the same time, of course, uh, given that the 10-year or 7-8 year period, we've seen a structural change in the economy, a lot of, uh, you know, unutilized or, you know, closed down items which are not really relevant, they had to be dropped off. That was very necessary. And hence, we have seen the kind of upward revisions to the IAP numbers uh, that, that, that are getting reflected in the new series. Quick uh, conceptual question, Upasna. So what's the ideal or accepted lag between, let's say, some changes that have happened in the economy in terms of what's getting consumed and not, and these indices reflecting that? Uh, no, if I got the answer cor uh, question correct, uh, I think uh, the lag behind the actual economic structure, see, uh, this is based on the 2011-12 uh, you know, NSSO surveys that were done, or uh, not just the NSSO survey, but the other surveys that are conducted to ensure that the economic structure is taken into account. So clearly, we are in 2017, and we're talking about 2011-12 base, but, but that kind of a delay is likely to happen, given that it is a humongous task to really collect the scale at which the data has to be collected to really, uh, you know, arrive at these kind of weights. So uh, that kind of a lag always exists, you know, even when 2004-05 uh, uh, base was there, um, you know, we, we had the data only for the previous surveys that were conducted, which was with a gap of four to five years. So uh, this is a typical, uh, you know, change that we tend to see or a lag that we tend to see, even though we moved on to 2017, we're still using a 2011-12 base. Okay, so uh, uh, Sujan, uh, I, is that lag, before I come to the impact, and I'll do that quickly, but is this something that we need to speed up? I mean, you know, compress the time, because the economy is changing much more dynamically than it did maybe even a decade ago. I couldn't agree more with you, mm. because if, if you if you look at particular uh, particularly the kind of products which are relevant and which are not, not relevant, you just take the example of uh, televisions. Mm. The way the technology in television is changing, mm. and uh, that holds true for most of the most of the consumer durables. Mm. This or lighting, even mm. if you look at mm. the ch the change is so tremendous. Mm. 
I think even a five year is a very long period. So we have to really recast our mm. data mm. to get more real uh, real time data. For example, if you look at for consumer expenditure survey, mm. the latest one which has been published mm. is about three year lag. Mm. So that data ultimately becomes redundant because mm. the structure is changing so fast. Mm. So I, I right. so that's I one agree. key takeaway. Okay, so now let's understand impact, right? So we've got a new series now, and how do you how does this going to or is this likely to play out on other indicators and the decisions we take on them? I think there is uh, there is going to be two dis uh, distinct things. One, the growth will look much better than what it was looking in terms of I um, in terms of IIP. Mm -hmm. The second thing and was does that have an impact on GDP as well? Uh, uh, see, the point the point is that as I said, GDP has already uh, already been revised. Mm. So re uh, rather, it will be more in line with the GDP mm. rather than it will uh, okay. impacting the GDP. Right. Okay. The second thing is the uh, while you have changed the uh, base for CPI, mm. you didn't change the base for WPI. Mm. Now uh, there are certain clues which you draw even from WPI. Now with this changed changed base, drawing those clues whether it's for, uh, for monetary policy, even if monetary policy is targeting CPI, but they cannot lose sight of the WPI. Mm. So uh, I think the decision making process get uh, improved in the mm. in this. Right. So we will see perhaps slight improvement in growth mm. and perhaps slight softening in inflation mm. at this current juncture. Right. Okay. So Upasna, you know, one of the big concerns in this economy uh, has been the slowdown or not so fast growth in the manufacturing sector. Now the numbers obviously reflect a slightly different picture or the revised numbers. So could this have any potential impact on the way, let's say, monetary policy response or any other fiscal policy response in future coming or in coming days? I think Govit, just going back a little on the data, if you look at the uh, new series, even though it is, you know, a tad higher than the old series, uh, you know, the IAP series is still suggesting a slowdown. If you look at the quarterly averages of the last four to six quarters, you know, like let's say pre-demonetization and post-demonetization. Uh, Pre-demonetization, already one quarter uh, before demonetization was announced, we already started seeing the quarterly averages of IAP coming down in the new series I'm talking about. And that has obviously, you know, that got aggravated, the slowdown in uh, the uh, post-demonetization period. Even right now, we have not seen that really stabilize. So clearly, post-demonetization, the slowdown in the manufacturing segment especially has continued and we are not seeing that stabilize yet. So uh, on the growth side, while yes, the IAP series is higher than the older series, it still is suggesting a slowdown. And that is something which definitely the policymakers will have to take uh, note of. Uh, but having said that, it is more important for RBI to be focusing on inflation and given the kind of challenges that they would be facing, and especially in the second half of the year, uh, their hands may be a little tied at the moment. Okay, so I'll pick up on that, uh, Upasna. So, you know, growth in, in has been in the, under the new IIP was 1.6% in this uh, December to March period as against 4.9% uh, previously. So, therefore, there was a slowdown thanks to demonetization. So, two questions. So, one is, uh, do we therefore now need to respond to demonetization or the impact of it in some way? Or in general, do we need to do something to boost manufacturing? See, uh, actually, if you, if you look at the numbers, the, the numbers for the um, uh, quarter ending March, mm. for example, uh, for the com consumer co companies, mm. we are actually seeing a traction back. Mm -hmm. If you see the volume numbers for FMCG companies, mm. the, so I think that the impact of demonetization and more importantly for the for manufacturing companies, particularly the consumer facing ones, the wholesale trade disappeared mm. because that's cash based. Mm. There has been a normalization in, the, in, in terms of that. Now to come to the fundamental issue, is the manufacturing gro uh, growth uh, satisfactory? Mm. Of course it's not. Mm. And it's not globally. Mm. And also if you, if you look at the way uh, that still there is significant amount of global excess capacity in the manufacturing. So given that, mm. I don't think in the immediate term for the se sector as a whole, and by immediate term I mean in the next mm. one year, mm. I don't see too much of traction coming back into manufa manufacturing which will uh, start a capex cycle or things like that. So to that. ask a very broad question, what needs to be done? See, the ob ob obviously uh, uh, the, you have to focus the sources of growth, mm. not manufacturing alone. Mm. For example, if services is your major, engine, yeah. ma major engine, you have to look at job creation. Mm. So I think the biggest uh, missing link here is job creation. Mm. Obviously, it's not possible to create so much job in manufacturing mm. and services is the uh, is the bigger chance. Mm. So improve skill, create create job, that should be the priority and that will eventually increase lead to your increase in demand and manufacturing right. production. Right, right. Uh, Sujan, thank you so much. And thank you, Pasna. We run out of time completely. That's all we have time for on Policy Watch this week. We'll be back next week, same time. Thanks.